that's cool. Uh, Mickey. Mick or Mickey? Mickey. Mickey will do. Mickey. Yeah. Long time coming. Uh, cheers, buddy. Yeah, cheers, man. Fucking awesome. Yeah, I'm, I can't drink it. It's too hot. It's too hot. <laughs> that's, I was hoping you weren't going to drink it. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, it's uh, green beret coffee. Are we right? Are we right? I know. Uh, it's nice, though. It's nice. It. It's nice. As long as it's stronger. It's a, it's a green beret veteran coffee. Mate, so... Um, I was we were talking off air. Yeah. I was saying, yeah, we were talking about anti doping. You're just waffling, aren't we? Like, yeah. Obviously, with your uh, flipping man machine stuff, beast, beast mode stuff. And I, I just before this, is thinking, uh, and I obviously, and then we were talking, we were going to start off, and I said I want to come to mental, mental health thing. And I, I in the past, I've been guilty of uh, of coming on a podcast with the intent of this is what this is. I'd really like to get to this with the guest, but sort of dancing around it because yeah. I don't want to. I don't. Wanna, I don't want to. Almost like offend someone, or think, oh, where can I go with that? Where can I? Where can I not? But like I said just now, like the mental health aspect interests me. Obviously, with, with your with your past, um, and losing your legs, uh, amongst other injuries, right? Yeah, yeah. As you were saying, there's I think in hardship, mental hardship, physical physical, physical hardship, and then a the mental hardship. There's lessons to be learned. Those lessons, like we were saying, those lessons are, are common lessons that can be applied to anyone, I think, who've gone through mental hardships. Yeah, it's yeah. just how you get there's different. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing, like, with, with the incident you were involved in and what happened, that it must have been some pretty flipping horrendously low, low, they might not have been, pretty horrendously low points. Um, However you want to go about it, in yeah, yeah. terms of describing how you got to that position of a mental state and how you got out of it, go for it. Because I think there's a lot to be learned. You're a fucking amazing bloke. You're an amazing bloke, ama- amazingly strong mentally and, vis- and physically. Oh, no, cheers, man. <laughs> go for it, mate. I want, I, li- my, I'm open. I'm open. Yeah. I've seen your videos yeah, online no. and you were one of the most inspiring people. Yeah, no. Do you know mental health? It's just, I don't know what they're saying. It's, it's that blooming puzzle wrapped up in a... Do you know that Russian saying about you just can't work it out? And we were talking there about you could have a hundred different people have a hundred different ways that work. And it's just if you can have talk tap into that one person that you might help. But if we just take my take my mental sort of health deteriorating from like one second after the bang. Because if we go into the pre deployment build up and everything, that sort of stuff can just even drive you mad because you know what we like we're trying to I've spoke about it to friends before no one really ever spoke about getting blown up but what do you mean do you know so if we were doing a pre-deployment training it would be whoever spoke about yeah are you going to go and see my missus if I get blown up who's going to go and tell my mum the anticipation being that you'd be dead yeah yes because you're like I've always looked at it like I've seen people get shot I was on Herrick 12 and it was you know, and it was quite a nasty time 2009 to 2010 and you know, we, we ended up collecting so many injuries and it seemed like every week somebody was coming into Wooten Bassett repatriated, you know what I mean different cat badges one thing about IEDs, they don't they don't discriminate about rank cat badge, culture creed, you know what I mean, you stand in it and you're, and you're getting it but one thing I knew, I, I was a high risk search advisor, so I was like an asset to use infantry lads. You would call me in, unfortunately, if one of the lads got blown up. If you had big intelligence about uh, IDs in your area, do you know what I mean? If you had a couple of bad results the week before. Or we would just be maybe just in your patrol base waiting on someone else from higher to go, right, we've got, we've got some and we need to go and search this area but the one thing we always knew is if you stand in it you're going to be very lucky to open your eyes you get shot you know, in the gap you've seen guys get shot and then you get, it's in no way you know, it just doesn't look as sore as when a guy gets blown up no and you think man I'll take one in the shoulder you know what I mean <laughs> give me two in each shoulder rather than get blown up because he just he gets like chopped in half in it yeah so we, it's one thing we never talked about really is what would happen if we got blown up. It really come home to me on my, uh, I was doing a pre-deployment 
training. Strangely, with Dave Henson, who is, is now one of my good mates and was the captain of the Invictus Games, and I was in Rio with him. There was like eight of us on the course, and uh, me and Dave came back as double amputees. So I don't even know what the percentage is. That 20% was coming back as double amputees. So we knew the threat that was there, but I don't know, we never talked about it as much. I speak to people now and they go, why don't you talk about what happens the minute you get blown up and what happens the minute you die? What are you going to do for my family if I die? Do you know, if you're on real party, are you going to scoop it all up? Are you going to, as the informant officer tries to go to my wife or my mum, are you going to go, no, no, stop. I know, Mickey, we already talked about this. Because you just never talked about it, so... We never really thought about that that mental side of it, but why do, why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. I, do you think maybe it's uh, I, I, it's a good point? I've not. I didn't realise that before myself. <clears throat> it was the same with you know. It was the same with the infantry. Like, yeah, I, yeah. You nine squadron, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just the same. But do you think maybe it's because uh, it's some it's something that you wouldn't talk about because it uh, it may instill fear and then impact the capability on the ground? Maybe I don't know. Well, it shouldn't, but do you know what I was sort of, so I was a senior in my patrol, but if I come in and everybody was talking about getting blown up, I'd be like, boys, fucking let's change the subject, I think. Come on, let's get our head into tomorrow. Yeah. No one's getting fucking blown up. That's what's happening. Do you know what's happening tomorrow? No one's getting blown up. I'm trying to think of examples where that, where, where, um, I'm trying to think of where people, when I was out there, got shot or killed, and what we did after. It was, uh. Do you know what it was? It you wasn't, it wasn't after, spoken about. It wasn't spoken about ever. You, just, you, so you, 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 you deal with it yourself and you crack on to whatever the next task is. Could be the same day or the next day. But no, you're right. It wasn't spoken about until he got home, really. And uh, or he got mentioned, oh, yeah, he's repatriated, he got buried, and that was it, you know? Yeah, and some of the worst thing is that you'd still be out there and lads would be coming back and you and you couldn't get. You wouldn't get back to Bastion for sometimes weeks, you know what I mean? You wouldn't get back necessarily to a phone and you couldn't even like phone up to speak to one of the lads just to see how the funeral went. You, know, you just sort of sat there and uh, it's, I think it's a weird feeling. You're just in your own little world, sort of detached from it, but just on a mental health side, I never really went into anything before it. I, I must admit, I just went into robot mode. Get the guys trained, get my team ready. Am I ready? Yeah, we're fucking ready to go. Right, let's make sure we get through this tour because we know we're going to get a lot of IED threats because the IED threat went through the roof. Especially with you infantry lads, you're smashing them all over the place if they want to start having a fucking firefight with you. So you just got smart, didn't they? You're making IEDs out of wood. You're still going along with your fucking stupid metal detectors. I know. I know. You, know you, only, you were only getting a hit on the copper wire which was going to connect the whole circuit. And there was so much brass in the ground, you wouldn't make, you wouldn't take two steps over there without it going off beep beep. So the lads in at the front, it's always the young lads. Lads at the front have to try and discriminate about what what what's a hit and what's not. And then next thing you get that fucking noise, you know what I mean? You know it's like when an ID goes off, it's a boom. I used to hear that sometimes in the patrol base, and I would just go straight to the option because we would get called out on as a, as a contact reports coming in because. So there's a thing in there if there's one IED there's normally more and what's the lads doing and there's multiple casualties do you know what I mean? and that was one of some of the worst things when you talk about mental health stuff if you're in the ops room and you ever fucking listen to the radio when people are dealing with that it's mm -hmm. like you want to walk out in it you're just listening to them fucking the chaos and as we were talking about maybe getting shot if you, you know, when you're getting shot in the head it's bad news obviously you're getting but if you can just do you know what I mean try and avoid getting blown up out of all things but I don't know we never really thought about it but then the, I fucking stand on the, the IED with my left foot and then guess what you think about it straight away I had gave the lads at the front and all the two young guys at the front was on the violins and you know, I was just busting their ass the whole tour I needed them to stay switched on good lads but you know they drift a bit they probably fucking hated me really but uh the thing is, I get blown up. Who comes back to patch me up? I'm the senior in the patrol. Fucking more or less in the middle. Everybody else is dealing with the effects of fucking their hearing and, 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 and all the shit that's just come around them. 
and you, 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 you're trying to come to hoping that's probably the full screw that's going to be giving it the uh, first aid and it's the two lads you've been busting their ass and you're looking at them and they're looking at you that's one thing I always remember you can't hide the eyes of the other person you're looking at them and you're hoping that he's going to sort of crack a joke or something but then the guy starts crying is that what happened with you? Yeah, you just see tears in their eyes, and you're like, fuck. Fuck me. Because you you're just being cut in half, man, you know what I mean? My hand was pissing blood. Left leg was gone, fucking red mist. And then the right leg was just uh, just all fucked up, you know what I mean? You, know what you, see on the, you do see on these fucking Game of Thrones, I was like, the army of the dead, you know what I mean? <laughs> this, le- this right leg was just... I've never had a spare rib since, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine a spare rib, because you could just see all that. And I actually ended up fucking around with the Kazivak, because I think the lads didn't want to grab it, because there was still stuff on the right-hand side. And I think it was sort of hanging off. And yeah. Because I was such a big lump, they kept on dropping me. I always laugh, because the explosion blows your fucking pants off. So I remember looking down, and every lad that's ever, ever been blown up, double amps, your legs are gone, you check, make sure your cock and balls are still there. Right, but I tell you what, they're red as fuck because I just took the biggest hammer in their life. I was looking down, going, right, they're fucking bleeding and they're swollen and they're red as fuck, but they're still there and that'll do me. And, but you also think, where the fuck is my pants gone? This is bad enough, man, right? This is bad, but now I've got no fucking pants on, right? Oh, sorry, I fucking spill my brew. Do you know what you I mean? You're like, laugh. my fucking legs are off and now, and now I'm getting Kazi back with no fucking pants on. And the lads don't know if they should fucking try and put a dressing on my nutsack. Do you know what I mean? Your fucking cock's bleeding. I'm like, it's there though, so we'll take that. We're happy with that. You know what I mean? Your leg's hanging off. I'm just in and out of consciousness going, just get me, get me. Because I, I, had, I had done the Kazi back route. Fucking senior NCO. I knew exactly where everybody needed to be. I knew how long the Merc would take to come in. We'd actually had some Pathfinder boys behind us. Uh, and their armoured vehicle with fucking gym piece, uh, 50 cal sitting on the top. Wasn't he really worried about anything else coming after it? You know, the IED activating a contact. So I knew the guys would just fucking rip it open. And actually we had satellite and troops just in and around the area anyway. So it was all it was all we do just getting me back in time. But uh, sometimes you can be sort of overqualified. I'd done a lot of medical training. And I could see how much I was bleeding. Because all the lads who normally got blown up were bleeding out, weren't they? If they opened their eyes after it, and then he still died, it'd either be infection or bleeding out. So there's not none of this. Here we breathe in circulation. Let's go. If he's fucking open his eyes, stop the bleeding. Don't be worrying about everything else. Uh, but and I was bleeding. You can put the tourniquets on when you get blown up, but it just... It's just stops it a wee bit you know what I, mean? I could just see it I could feel myself and I had in my head I had to stay awake everybody I'd seen in the sort of last sort of eight weeks of what I was over there or whatever everybody I'd seen get to the mert had lived in my head we used to speak about it with the lads if we get to the mert we're alright and they fucking boys will come in won't they they will come in to anything I know like the lads were sitting back and basting and I'll get, get a lot of shit but if you're on that mert team or you're on the Apaches, we were giving them any sort of cover. They fucking come in and they save lives, and, and it's as simple as that. Yeah, keep going, I like this coffee. Yeah. Go on. Uh, so we were happy, we talked about it. We can get, if we can get, if we ever got hit to the mer, we were going to be all right. But I knew it was going to take about sort of 12, 13 minutes if there wasn't another incident. On foot? Know, just until the mer come and probably oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. T- until we got back to the to the PB, our, our route was sort of PB 1, 2, 3 and 4 we were on that route fucking tried them guys were getting smashed all over uh, was just, that nice? yeah just because we had fucking agreed do you know what I mean every farmer and every villager the, the route had been agreed do you know what I mean we're going to build you a route it's going to come through your fucking farm we're going to give you some money so that they were all put under pressure to make sure it was seeded with IEDs I I, I I just accepted it. One thing I always thought about that, the Afghan people is, we're only passing through. We're fucking passing through, man. And do you know what? The three guys sat up in the wee hill, smoking, and the Afghan squat watching them. 
They are the guys who are going to be here for a long time. If you're getting threatened that your daughter's going to get her head cut off, do you know what? You fucking lay IEDs, because I would. Yeah. So, you get blown up, man. You get blown up. You know the risk. But, uh, so we're doing it. Do you know what? One thing I did think when I opened my eyes, and I remember thinking this. I said, you've, you've missed your first chance to kill me. I've opened my fucking eyes. You fucked up there, because I'm no dead yet. That's weird, isn't it? That says more about my stupid <laughs> head than anything. Raga. Yeah, because I opened my fucking eyes and I was like, do you know what? You never fucking got me there. I bet you thought that out, that would have just cut me in half and Mate, killed that's me. that's just fucking... That's just that mental strength warrior straight from the start. Uh, straight from the start. Boom. Yeah. You start, like, you, pardon the pun, you're stepping off from the right foot mentally that way, do you yeah. know what I mean? You're yeah, on, yeah. You, it's, it's weird, man, but... Some of my mates didn't open their eyes and they were better people than me. Do you know he's better soldiers, just better fucking people. Do you know what I mean? More caring, kinder. Just generally a better people. And they, do you know when you talk about fate? Do you know what I mean? It's just so sometimes a lot of bullshit. Better people than me, better soldiers, better men, better fathers, better sons didn't open their eyes. And I had opened my eyes. So fucking strike one to me. All I need to do now is get back to the mer. Got back to the PB, and do you know what? No one was talking only about two or three hundred metres. And I remember in the news at that time, they used to have this shit about fem- females being on the front line, but there's no fucking front line. We know that. It's just this fluid crap that everybody moves around in sort of confusion where you are. But I knew that we were at the front because we were clearing it for everybody to come back because that day we had a lot of intelligence that was IEDs. And I remember getting back to this girl medic. <coughs> And I'd seen her treat, treat a couple of Gurkhas that were blown up. And I thought, I just need to get to her. You know, if I get to her, fucking she ain't going to let me die. Cool as a fucking cucumber. Do you who, know what who mean? was that? Who was I that? Know, I never knew her name. You need to find out her name. I do need to hear it. 12, 1st of July, 2010. But yeah, I remember her. You've seen her around, in it, And next thing you're fucking turning up with no legs. This big, bald, hairy, tattooed guy. And you're looking at her saying, don't let me die. Do you know what I mean? You, you fucking... You definitely... Are looking saying, do your stuff, man. And do you know what? She did. And, I, and the last thing that I can remember is just the back blast and the heat of the, of the merc coming in. I remember the two uglies coming in and just, do you know, and just spray around. I was happy. I was like, right, no one, there's nothing happening. No the confusion. There's no, no one's involved in some firefight because I fucking initiated an IED. You know what I mean? No one else in my head is getting sort of injured. I just need to get on this merc. And then just go on it. The, the Gurkha lad, uh, Sergeant Major, was there, you know, they're in there saying, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. I was like, fuck, I'm out. I've got no legs. I've got no legs and I'm hoping to keep this fucking cock and balls because they've been bruised up. And that was it, just got on the back of the mirror. I'm really happy. I don't know, high, low in situation when you talk about highs and low. So low, I get blown up. So happy about opening my eyes. So low because they kept on dropping me in there. Kazivak, because I was so fat and heavy, and I was soaking in blood with my pants off, and then so high when the merc comes, and that was it. Got uh, got put under, and I was in a coma for a week. Straight back. In- induced coma. Induced coma, straight back <coughs> that day, because other lads have been hit on that same day, come back with eight of us critical on the, on the flight Can back. Know. Yeah, yeah, eight of us come back, we're all in shit state. It was a, it was a bad day for whatever was going on. They're always kicking off in the summer, innit? Nobody wants to do anything in half camp and it's fucking freezing. They're not going to do anything before. It was a summer tour, was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I went out on the 13, that was a winter tour. And yeah, that was oh, my first winter tour. I was supposed to be on 13. Oh, yeah. I was supposed to be on 13. Because uh, uh, 9 Squadron were going to give engineer support to you, lads. And uh, just uh, the guys who had the same qualification as me, oh, fuck. A few of the lads got hit, and fucking couple of them died, and because I was pretty uh, squared away with all my calls, he just goes, Mickey, you're going to have to go out early. Which I was, you know, I was fine with it, it didn't really bother me. Uh, and, and do you know what? Probably makes no difference because, again, fucking better guys than me got blown up after me. Do you know what I mean? So that was it. But uh, yeah, 12. So 13 maybe isn't it, the lucky number, or unlucky number. 12 maybe is. Uh, Unlucky number for me. But then I was just coming back. That's when the mental health starts. Because I'm an Afghan with my mates doing what I want to fucking do. 
thinking I'm the hardest bastard in the whole of Afghan. My career's flying. Just picked up my staff sergeant. I'm 31 year old. Gone, man. Do you know what I, mean? I wake up in Birmingham. Get put under an Afghan in the PB. Still smelling the heat and the fucking the uh, do you know, aviation fuel. You get just a, that distinctive double rotor of the Merc coming in, and then you, you slowly get come out your coma, and your family's there looking at you. You're like, shit, wasn't a dream. Not an Afghan anymore. Didn't it? Never looked under the duvet. I know. I could remember that. I remember when my hand was hanging off, and. Uh, I was just hoping my hand was a... It's like the pub question, would you lose a hand or a leg? Fucking lose a leg every time. When you lose a hand, I've seen my mates that it's a pain in the arse. There's just so much you do with your hand. That <laughs> lose it. Listen, any pub quiz, lose a leg before a hand. Maybe you don't lose two legs before a hand. I don't know if that equates. But uh, I was so happy my hand was there. I couldn't see it. It was just up there. Because you sort of break everything. So it was like a comedy sketch. Both hands, so all my wrists for some reason broke. I think it's just I was holding my weapon. Sometimes a weapon will take the hand off, won't it? <clears throat> oh, really? It fucks off. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, oh. it just, the, the force sometimes take a hand, but it just all depends on how you had the pistol grip or maybe if your sling was on or off. But the hands were there. The wrists and the fingers and, do you know, and they, were all, they were all broken, but... Just open your eyes and it's just that time you're looking into your family's eyes and you're like, fuck. You know, you just think, man, fuck this up. That's in my head. I said, you fucked this up. What are you doing? Not not feeling sorry for myself at that point. But I could see that both, uh, like my missus at the time and my mum, uh, there was really only, in fact, they two that were there because we were in critical. And you're like, they just, they look worn, they look tired. I had no idea how long I'd been in a coma, and I was just like, what the fuck has happened here? They look like they've been through something. And I, I knew that I hadn't flew back, and I'd only just arrived that day, because they, would, they wouldn't have looked as bad as, <laughs> maybe they looked, thought they looked good. And you're like, shit, man, it's just, she went through a lot of bad times there. But, eh. Uh, do you know there's one thing there, and it sounds stupid, and I never want anybody to get hurt. But it's always good to be in positions when it's not just you on your own. And I remember as the nights were settling and I was still in intensive care, and I was looking to the right and the left of me, and you would just catch one of the other lads looking at you and just putting their hand up or a thumbs up or something. And you go, fuck, that guy's got no legs as well. Do you know what I mean? Because you know, you're like, fuck, right? He, he seems all right. How are you? How are you doing, mate? Look over there and you see, fuck, just imagine it. You know what I mean? It's like the living dead, triple amputees to the left, you doubles to the right. It was like a shit song. It was a shit butlin' song, man. <laughs> Yay, single amputees, step forward. I can go and shot wounds to the head. And, but you're like, right, do you know what? I'm not on my own here. And it's, I didn't even want them to be there. But they were, they were there. So I knew I, even in that critical care, I was, my next step's only going to be on my own. And it, it felt just a bit reassuring, really. Even though you think you're you're anything, but it brings you down to ground zero. Do you know what I mean? You're nothing now, because you can't even wipe your own arse. So you're totally reliant on somebody else. Uh, and, and, and initially, all you want to do is get out of that uh, intensive care unit, because people were still dying in there, and unfortunately people would come back... Uh, and you just hear all the alarms going off and I'm working on them and you go, fuck, I need to get out of this and when am I going to be good enough to get up to the ward? Because we were in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Hadn't even been opened yet. It was still Selly Oak, but they opened Ward 412 because we, they were running out of space because we were coming in. So 412 in that whole hospital was the first ward open and it was just full of squaddies. Was it a, a normal ward or, IC, or an ICU ward? So, I, so they had the ICU down the bottom and then they had the ward... And that was it. Right. Flipping. It wasn't, there was no, it wasn't even a cafe open. And then you just go up there and, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's like you had progress to go up there. Do you know what I mean? You felt like you had sort of been, I don't know, like promoted. Yeah, I'm on the ward now, with the lads. Fucking weird. But, uh, yeah. 
What um, <clears throat> what was, at what point was it in the hospital that uh, you started thinking long term about the impacts of the injuries, or was it after you left and sort of being out of the hospital and, and trying to do everyday things that you were able to do before, and now it completely changed? I think I think my lowest point was in the before before I had went to. Uh, Headley Court, just because I'd been I'd, I'd been in the army fifteen years already, and I had seen people from come back from Iraq and Afghan previously before me, and I knew one thing: I would never wear green kit again. The job was gone. I was a fucking combat engineer, probably specialised in demolitions. I can't I can't fucking set off a dam with the longest safety fuse ever as I'm wheelchairing away. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck! Give me two minutes. Wheelchair stuck in a puddle. Yeah, so I knew my career was over, and that, and that, you know what, that just, uh, oh no, no, I won't even lie, it pisses me off to this day, it pisses me off, that uh, I, I, my career got taken away from me. Even with everything you've achieved now? Yeah, I, I do talks and they'll say, would you change everything? I say, give me back one second before I, before I stood on that uh, IED and I, and I stepped to the left. Fucking hell. Because it wasn't supposed to end like that. And this is where I'm still on my journey with... I don't know, trying to digest what happened and and accept and see what. But in my 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 career was fine, my life was fine. It wasn't it supposed to end like that? You say that though. I mean, the reason I asked that question about yeah. when I said fucking hell, you said you you change everything, and to people listening, they think of course he'd fucking change everything. But you and I know multiple other yeah. amputees. You know what I mean? And I know quite a few who. Who will say it's like the best things ever happened to them? I know because, and I'm not suggesting that yourself. Fucking hell, mate, you're double amputee. You know what I mean? And for me, I wouldn't want to lose a leg or not lose anything. But I can understand where they're coming from to a certain extent because normality's gone. But then I think the way I think this is why they say it is because their they their life opens up their experiences open up to a wide variety of things that they wouldn't have had the opportunity to do otherwise and fucking right they should as well fucking right they should because look at what they went through look at what you went through right um and 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 what surprises me there with you is <clears throat> like i'm saying everything you've achieved now and what you stand for in terms of a a figurehead for what people can achieve when they've been through the most adverse, hideous circumstances and how much they can achieve and how much of a, a positive role model they can be, which is what you are definitely to me and to fucking countless yeah, other people, mate. And that's not just military, that's, that's civilian. When I watch your stuff online, you know, you do videos and that, yep. the airs are back, back on my neck stand up. And that doesn't I fucking hate those motivational videos and shit, right? Yeah. And there's very few that I'll, I'll look and go, fuck me. And yours, 100%, it makes the airs are back on my neck stand up because of the kind of person you are. Do you know what I mean? That's why it surprises me. I don't know. Do you not think that um, maybe you achieve more now than you maybe would have, or you, before? And I don't mean career-wise. I'm not yeah. saying that. I mean you're more of a force for good and have an impact on so many, many, many people positively than you could have before. Or, or, yeah. I don't know. I'm asking. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that does change when you get blown up. You become a better person. You absolutely do, because. <clears throat> I, I, I don't think we come from like a fucking basically an all male, all white, no chinks in your armor background. Do you know what I mean? That's that's the military, isn't it? Predominantly all white, predominantly all male. No one can say anything that might show a bit of weakness. Any weakness, going back to when I was in, sort of looked down on. No one was speaking about mental health. Fuck, no, there's no disabled people in the army. Do you know what I mean? What use were they? That's probably how it got looked at. So you definitely grow as a person now. Because I've spoke to, uh, you know what I mean? I'm disabled now. I'm in Paralympic teams. I'm involved with Invictus Games. I'm involved with Kazivak Club. We're all fucking injured. I don't just want to be injured, but we're all injured. But we're doing amazing stuff. And when you talk about trying to different people having opinions on never changing their lives. That's where I don't think I've moved forward. 
because I still want to be Mickey Yule before I got injured. And I know, and I, and I get uh, direct messages all the time, I know how much I'm inspiring people. I know how much going to Rio, winning Invictus Games stuff, going to Commonwealth Games, just speaking to people and telling my story. And I know how that is still making people's life better. And I know how actually it might get people to dark places and get them moving forward. Selfishly, still want to be on patrol with the lads. And I'll tell you why it is, because I never get that buzz. Ah, I, I never I, get I, that buzz. Okay, I see. I, 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 okay. I, and I, I absolutely, mate, I can't argue with that. I know exactly what you're saying. Um, and fucking hell, I'd say, I suggest that everyone who's out with the military now, in whatever circumstances, think the same thing, who's served yeah. any time on, on an operation. And I, I've had questions before when I've, I've been going to lifting. When I lifted in Glasgow Commonwealth Games, there's about 5,000 people watching it. Fucking 99% of them wanted me to win. And it's like, well, how are you going to deal with the nerves? What? What is this like the the highlight of your whole life? And I, do you know what I, I don't want to put the situation. It was good. <laughs> I love I loved it. It was all right. Do you know what I mean? It's a pretty good thing to do. Is it the same standard in front of a patrol that you know there's ten IEDs on it, and you're going to fucking walk down that, and you better find them. If you don't find them, someone's going to get blown up, and your arse is going like a rabbit's nose. Not the same. Different nerves. Spider senses in the back of your neck are going off because you're like fuck. You know some of those IEDs were so complex. Do you know I mean these are these are intelligent people that are laying down them. There's a reason why people leave Afghanistan with their tail between their legs. They're re <coughs> relentless little fuckers, aren't they? So yeah, so when I go, oh, I'm going to go and lift in front of Commonwealth Games. Like, yeah, it's it's great. I'm excited. I'm a wee bit nervous. I've been more. I've, I'm not fucking shit myself. I'm not where you're so in tune to your surroundings that it's even like slow motion, just watching the front guys step forward, get a hit, everybody down thinking, fucking hell, I hope this isn't daisy chained. I hope that's not the fucking first ID and that it goes all the way around us. And uh, and it's hard. It's, I, I, I listen to a lot of your podcasts and others and the one thing I think we all struggle, how do you how do you get that? without being addicted to substances or how how do you get that feeling of fucking raw fear? And why and why do we still need it? Why do you still need that? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should accept the Paralympics and that nerves and that excitement and others feeling so proud of me from what I've been through. Why can't I just not accept that? Why do I still have to fucking chase that raw fear? When I was um my uh, the I've had three three lots of um, three different lots of well, three different sort of um, times of counselling, <clears throat> and a second time, um, Megan guy. He's on the podcast, Dirk American guy. Fucking, was he Canadian? Oh shit, sorry, Dirk. Same American, same shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he uh, we came on this subject, and I had this mindset where. I I was I I was comparing myself to what I was before. Now, granted, physically, almost I'm the same as before, right? Which isn't the case yourself, but mentally, I'm not. And in my head, I was, um, I I was not. I was less of a person. I I was less of a person now than I was when I was serving, right? right. That's what I had yeah. in my head. Specifically, when I was on tour, much the same as you're thinking now. And you can argue in some respects, fucking absolutely. You know what I mean? I'm not as sharp as I as I was when I was on tour. You can never be, yeah. you know. Um, and all, my mindset was always, how I I how do I get back to who I was? How do I get back to being that person? Yeah. So I was always just looking at myself in terms mentally, in terms of I'm less than I could be. I need to get back to that person. And he said he he said to me it was a, it was a light bulb moment for me, and he said. Have you considered that you are who you are now? It's not that you you were something and you've gone down, 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 yeah. down. You've you you are you were who you were then, and you've just evolved as life goes on, and that's where you are now. Some things are different, 
and, and sort of less capable and other things are more capable. Yeah. He said, and that's how life goes on. You, Mickey, are not the same person as you were in a child. You're not the same person as you were 20 years ago. Yeah. And before you got blown up, you were in the same person as when you were 18, right? Yeah. And when you, and, and regardless of whether you, you'd step in the idea or not, in 10, 15, 20 years' time, you'd be a different person altogether. The difference is, because it's a gradual change over time, you don't notice the change, you don't compare yourself, it's just life. When something catastrophic happens, um, well, it didn't happen to me, I don't know how it came about with me, I think I just struggled with it. It, but it may have been, it may have been. Yeah, yeah, well. Yeah. Your change might have just punched, yeah. punched you in the face as much as me standing on an IED, because yeah. sometimes that comes um, on. And when he said that, it, it wasn't that I agree with what he said, it was, he, it was a way of approaching that mental state. So, he, so basically, instead of looking at it as, that's who, that's who I am, how do I get back there? It's accepting that this is who I am now. Yep. How do I deal with that? And what? how do I make best use of it? Basically, yeah. you know, because it's not possible to get back to who you were. It's not possible yeah. to get back to who I am. And then when I changed that outlook, I stopped thinking about, and this is, it was pretty fucking quick, mate. Because yeah. it was in my head, I was thinking about it. It's like, okay, this is who I am now. He's got to fucking get on with it. It's like, you know, you go on the ground and, and you, you go on the ground, you're going to be on the ground for three days, right? And you go, like, it's going to be a three-day op. You've been in this situation yeah. in Afghan or Iraq, wherever. It's going to be a three-day op. A fucking week later, right, fella, you've got another treats to go. You're yeah. like, fuck. You don't go, <laughs> I wish it was still a three-day op. Yeah, you just yeah. accept the situation. You crack on. You make best use of it. And yeah, that's right. And that's how, that's how I... Because for me, I'm not saying same for yourself, it's, it was literally a fucking flick switch. I thought... Yeah. Okay, let's try approaching it like that. This is who I am now. I'm going to make the best of it. And this is last year, mate. It wasn't fucking long ago, mate. Yeah. And things started to improve for me mentally pretty fucking quickly. Pretty, pretty quickly. It's definitely stuff I need to work on. I see some of my mates with the exact same injuries, even worse, and they're smashing it, and you think, man, I wonder what's going through their heads. What are they replacing it with? And maybe they're not, because they go, I don't need to replace it, because we moved on. I'm, I'm, and I'm accepting moving on, but some people don't even get that depth of thought. We're so complex. Yeah, you know, it's like I think we overthink it, man. That's what I, I, I just think I'm an overthinker. Do you know when you're just like, there should be no reason because you're right. I don't chase the feeling of driving motorbikes when I was 16 <clears throat> up in the farmer's field. That was mad. You know what I mean? Some of the times back there, some of the best days of your life, isn't it? I'm not trying to chase that because I accept that that was then, and I'm now. 40 year old two kids you know what I mean but then I'm still like come on but, uh, but the difference there is though is that fucking I mean going to war mate going to battle yeah. that is primal yeah that is primal I mean and it's and the other thing with it is is that and this is why it's, uh, for me was it is very or it's very difficult to come back to the UK between tours even on R&R &R after when they'd when they done and no one was out there because one aspect is especially the R&R &R, your mates are out there I don't want to be an R&R &R. I want to be out there. Why aren't I with my mates? Why am I not with my mates? And I, I don't want R&R. &R. That's what I was like. But then when you're out there, as you know, mate, it's su such a simple life. Simple. Not easy. Simple. Yeah. You go. You look after your food. You look after your water. You look after your weapon, your ammo, and you look after your fucking men. And you do the mission. And that those are like five things you need to worry about. All the rest, like your tactical awareness, operational awareness, and strategic thinking, depending on which level you're at, that's second nature. Like driving a car, yeah. right? But outside of that, you don't have to worry about anything else. It's simple. Hard, but simple. And fucking primal. Because if you fuck it up, you're yeah. dead. Yeah. If, you, if you fuck it up, one of your lads is dead. Or someone in another unit who gets affected indirectly is dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? But again, it's simple. So that was one of the big things that I was relieved about when I got back and no one else had got injured. Because I don't know how I would have dealt with that. And I know lads that still deal with that now. It's fucking one of the worst. And... I wouldn't, I wouldn't put want that on anybody. Luckily for me, no one else got injured, but yeah. I think you just need to, every year, become that wee bit more wiser. Every year, just be that. Because I'm definitely better than what I was. God, you used to work it how the fuck you could just get back to that. And, that, and, and, and that's when uh, you slip down these, these roads. But there's some dark places there. I never had the same, it's a strange thing, but when I went to Headley Cup, where I think if you asked the lads who got injured, it might have been some of the worst times. Like people would say Headley Cup was the best place they could go to, some lads would go, it was a fucking nightmare and they couldn't wait to leave it, do you know what I mean? 
there's there's opposites of exactly uh, how people's feelings were about that place. But to me, mentally, I was all right. It was just physically, that it was more physical there. I was pretty happy. I could see guys three months ahead of me. Do you know what I mean? The exact same injuries, walking. I was like, bang, that's me in three months. There's a triple amputee over there. He got blown up six months before me. He's going down the fucking pub. They're on the piss tonight. Man, he's, go he's going out. That was one thing I, I used to struggle, struggle on. Just how people look at you. Because I'll tell you one thing. You cannot walk into a room as a double amputee and no one's going to look at you. You've become the centre of attraction. And I hated it. I didn't want to be the same. I used to try and wear long trousers. You just can't hide it. If you wear long trousers, people think you'll shit yourself. Because they're like, fucking, look, he's either drunk or he's shit himself. He just oh, because the way you're walking. Yeah, because the way you're walking. So you may as well wear fucking shorts. <laughs> yeah, because you can, you look at all this shit here. Do you know what I mean? I've got, always got Allen keys on me and everything. I'm always adjusting stuff. But uh, I just hated people looking at me. And, and, and I remember when I started changing my view on that, it's just uh, kids. Because kids, kids will accept anything. And kids will come up and go, I want to look at your legs, mate. Can I look at your legs? Are you a transformer? Are you a robot? And you're like, no, mate, I, I hurt myself. And they're like, where are these legs connected? Can I have a closer look? Can you walk for me? Where the dad or the adult is looking going, I don't want to ask any questions. But they want to know as well. But I want to look, but I don't want to say anything. Because he's big and he's bald and he's got loads of tattoos and he's got fucking metal legs. I don't want that work. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like kids, I've had kids say to me, do you stand up and fall asleep? You no, know, like a transformer just go... Arr! power off I was like no mate but when I started speaking to kids and then I was done a few talks at schools I was like do you know what you're just you're just different if someone walked past me before I got injured I would have probably known if it was a squaddy but even if I go when I was sort of younger walking on fucking a set of metal legs you look if you don't look you're, you're weird because there's something crazy going over there but look once. I always think we adults look once, two, look twice. Don't look three times, mate. Especially if it's a guy, you're taking the piss now. Do you know what I mean? You've looked once. You've looked two. You've got an idea what's going on. Don't keep on staring at me, mate. Do you know what I'm trying? I'm trying. I'm out with my missus having a drink. But uh, kids, man, the kids make you feel better because they come over and they just go, oh, man, these legs are crazy. Icebreaker. Yeah, yeah. And it makes you. Do you know what? Instead of you, you hide them no more because it's easy to turn into a hermit. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to leave the room. You don't want to leave the house. Some people get really comfortable in being at Headley Court because everybody's a bit fucked up back in the day there. And the minute you left, you had to go into normal society. And people look at you. And if you're in a wheelchair, people will look at you. We used to go out and uh, go shopping and go to cinema. It was like part of the, you know, the, the build-up training. Fucking tenuous. Not not a leg between us, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Fucking hardly any arms walking down Guildford High Street, you know what that's like? It's like a free-for-all. thing is, at the top of a slope, when you commit to it as a double amputee, you're going to the bottom. <laughs> right? You don't want anybody fucking around in front of you. You're committed to that hill. The legs are yielding. You've got a good rhythm. You don't want some old fanny coming out in front of you, pissing about. <laughs> Move out of the way. You've got a bunch of lunatics coming down here with no legs. <laughs> We're committed to it. We're going all the way to the bottom. The only reason we'd stop ever there was probably a pub, but uh, but you, I had some I had some great times at Headley Court, and that's weird because mentally it or it could have been the worst times for people. But I used to always think, and it's a weird thing. You know what it's like. We've all lost pals. Their family would want him to be there. Do you know what I mean? The people who had died would have done anything to be fucking wearing these stupid legs. Do you know what I mean? When you look at it like that, you, know, you sort of just look at your problem. What is my problem? My problem is I'm trying to walk on stupid fucking legs and I don't want anybody to look at me. And they hurt. Right, that, 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 that's, that's a piss you off a little bit. You know? But with the guys who are coming back in Royal Wooten Bassett, mm. their families would do fucking anything to have their son's phone up whinging about the legs not fitting. And I used to keep that in my mind. So you fucking get on with it, son. Get over yourself, kind of Fucking thing. come yeah. on. Toughen up. And then you would look... Oh, you do, you'd, you'd, we didn't have to look two metres at Headley Court for motivation. To me. I was one of the probably the older ones. I got injured when I was 31. 
are you looking at fucking 18 year olds with no legs? Being in the military six months. Probably first two or probably got blown up in the second week of the first two. That's fucking hard, man. You know, and they're getting on with it. They're grinding it out. They've fucking got a great attitude. Do you reckon it's um, a, a, a harder struggle mentally or an easier easier per- path if you're younger to get that kind of injury? I don't know. I'm asking. Do you know what? Do you know what? I don't know, I don't know, I just, I mean, they're probably, I would think that they might think, how the fuck am I going to get a chick? Who's going to want me now? Do you know what I mean? Where I, I had a missus, I had a kid. Uh, where I used to struggle is, where, where do I sit now within the family? Do you know what I mean? Because I used mean? to, because I, I, you know, everybody's a fucking chief, every guy's a chief of their clan, isn't they? The top man. And trouble comes to the door, we'll take care of it. Anything happens there, we'll take care of it. I'm the fucking chief of this family. And then suddenly, physically you're not. Physically you're probably the fucking weakest in the whole family. Trouble comes to the door. What, you're going to ask something, wait a minute whilst you get in your wheelchair and wheel to the door to deal with it. I, I really struggled from going, I can take care of anything, no one can touch my family, to fucking hell. I might be a little bit of a burden on them. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Everything needs planned. That's one thing when you start uh, initially when you're a double amputee, you plan family days out and you come along and there's 40 steps and you're in the wheelchair maybe with that day. Your missus can't carry you up the 40 steps. You have to bounce at your wheelchair and go up on your arse. You don't really want to do that. You know, you never, you know, you might, it might be fucking raining or you just don't want to do it or you get to another point and it's just a, a bit of track where you can't go down and you see all the kids wanting to go down there and you're like, oh, Dad has to go the other way. That used to really drive me mad. I would take myself away, just <coughs> insist on them going down. Take myself away and I'd just beat myself up. It's like, fucking hell. Little things like that. But I, the thing is, as you get better on your legs, you can sort of bust around it and really anything that comes across you, 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 you would work a way around it. But initially at the start, it's just like, what am I bringing to the family at the moment? Mm. I'm not. I'm not the protector of the, in my clan. I am not. Do you know what I mean? How do you see it now? Well, I, th- I think this is why I started doing a lot of sport. Do you know what? There's in a weird little way because I remember my son was three when I got injured. My daughter's just three now, so she sort of come in when everything's all right. Do you know the sort of glory days? But when he was three, there wasn't wasn't anybody else in his class that got dad got blown up. Do you know when you talk about there's this spider's web of people dealing with mentally what happens to you? Like my mum has to deal with it. My missus has to deal with it. My son is now Charlie Yule. His dad got blown up. It's like that's his name. Or that's a, that's a wee boy whose dad got blown up. That's a, that's a wee boy that's dad's got no legs. So it's how he deals with that, you know what I mean? And I used to just struggle with it and I used to think right do you know what I, I, I might just get to be the strongest fucking guy in Britain what if I was the strongest disabled guy in Britain but I had no legs where is the scales <laughs> I would think I feel like I'm bringing the scales back up because mm-hmm. then he could go well my dad might not have any legs but he's really strong do you know what I mean and I'd go man just where? how can you bring the scales back because at that time I'll say this about my mum. You're always your mum's little boy. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, when you get blown up, I was 31. Thought I was this big old lump. Fuck, it breaks him, mate. It breaks him. You're still your mummy's little boy. You're still your son, your son's first hero. And you can't wipe your arse. You can't push your wheelchair. You can't go to sports day because the grass is wet and your wheelchair won't go through it. And you're like... I need to even this off. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to thrash myself. I can get strong. I can go to the Commonwealth Games. I can go to the Paralympics. I can win and this game, the golds. And maybe, and I, and he would never say this because he would just accept it because kids do. So this is all about me. Selfish, this is for me that maybe Charlie will go, yeah, see, my dad's got no legs, but he's that. Do you know what I mean? Just try and even like, the scale. That was, just, that, was the inten- that was literally the intention. Yeah, yeah. To make, to make, to try and rebalance, and I, I, I cross everything. I, I cross from my mum and my missus, 
I didn't want to be, fuck, he's in a wheelchair. We want him to get walking on his legs, but he's not because he says I'm sore. He just stays in all day. I couldn't be that guy. I had to be them. I wanted the conversation to change. Instead of talk, instead of the conversation to be what your weakness is, how fucking awesome you are at something. I wanted it. So do you know when they spoke with their mates that they went, what's Mickey's next competition? Not, how's Mickey? Is he still, still in the house? How's things at home? I wanted, I wanted them to have, and I'm sure they did have, right? But I felt that you're a bit of a letdown to the family. You're just a bit of a letdown. And, and, and you thought they thought that? Just fuck off, mate. Yeah, I know, but this is where you put yourself in I, your fucking mind. Yeah, yeah. This is where you put yourself in your mind that you're uh, you're just a pain. You feel like you're just a pain in the arse. Do you know what I mean? And so, yeah, initially, doing all the sport was just selfish. I needed to try and get Mickey Yule back. I felt like Mickey Yule was still fucking laying in the sand pit of Afghanistan, bleeding out. I felt like half my soul had been left there. I needed to get something back. Just get a bit of physicality back about me. Do you know what I mean? Because you turn into a sack of shit. You're on so much meds. You're on so much surgery. <clears throat> you catch yourself in the mirror and you don't recognise the guy. You're like, fucking look at that, man. What are you doing? How much of a, how much of a gym queen were you before? Pardon the expression. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you beast try, before. Try and change it. Beast. I, I done power lifting before. you done it before, yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you this fucking strange thing. Hey, and pray to God, we got nothing coming up that the lads have to ever do this. But if you're, if you're going to a place that you think you might get blown up, squat. Squat your fucking arse off because the surgeon says my legs were so little and fat that they sucked up a lot of that blast. Do you know what? My legs were just so big that they took the fucking impact. It should have been cut me in half, really. Because one of the things... Because so much muscle out, you mean? Yeah, just fucking mass. Mass to absorb the blast. And the surgeon goes, did you train? And Because uh, I remember coming up, no, you come to the coma and I've got all your pictures up and I had a lot of me power lifting. And he went, do you know what? Those fucking little fat legs probably saved his life. <laughs> so squat, man. If, you're gonna go, if there's a chance you're going to get blown up, squat and squat and squat again. But, uh, do you know the, the weird thing is I was never as strong as what I am now I was never as strong different mentality like I train hard on it what, what, so what what, what do you what sports did you go into when you started then when you started competing hang yeah, on a so how, how did you start in, when did you start training how soon after the injury uh, I was probably training the minute I could I remember being in the in the ward at 412 and asked me to bring weights up just mentally I had to change it I had I had to change the. Uh, I, I didn't want a surgeon to come in and tell me when they operate. I didn't give a fuck. Someone was going to come and grab me when I need to just. Do you know what? In between it, give me something to do. I need to train. I used to see myself in the mirror, and I just felt shit, and I was getting weaker and weaker. I know. I, I, my mum and my missus seen this, and it's hard hard now to imagine. And they told me after it, but I was getting so weak and so just drained and skinny that when they were doing the blood pressure they took a small boy's uh, no, the, the arm wrap to take your blood pressure it was a small boy's uh, size that they used so they had a small adult and it was too big and then they used the small boys and I never noticed it and that's how just weak and skinny I was getting and then they told me after it and I could just feel myself I was just so weak drains the life at you but yeah, and then you get going. And I don't want to, this gets said too often, right? But I can only talk to me about me personally. But sport took me away from all this shit. It really did. And it's not a cheesy line that I'm wanting some sponsor to join. Sport, it didn't save my life because I was, uh, I was on a road and I knew where I was going to go. And I was mentally felt like I was a, in a good enough place to keep on motoring even if it wasn't sport, but doing powerlifting and changing my diet to make weight and, and having the discipline to go to the gym every day at a certain time and be committed to that two hours training to then be ready to perform at a competition maybe eight weeks' time just changed my mindset. It wasn't about operations. It wasn't about fucking uh, not being able to go down a steep hill on my legs. These were just all sort of by the by. That was happening anyway. 
I wasn't going to change. Yeah, bigger things. My mind was on fucking lifting. My, my mind was going to try and break into the British Paralympic team. I didn't know nothing about Paralympics. I'd never watched it. I say this to the lads who are in the team now. It, it's, I don't, I didn't view disabled people in any negative way. I just didn't have them in my social group. So I wouldn't watch disabled sport. But once I seen that there was a, a disability sport within powerlifting, that was it. It was all I was got to do. I couldn't do any of it. I couldn't do any of the uh, sort of, you know, like the skill level stuff. I've always been shit at darts. Do you know what I mean? I can't play pool and fucking crap, but I can lift. Ever since I've been little, I can lift a big rock. I could lift a big bit of wood and hump it around when I was little. Just started <clears throat> obviously going through a career. I was always in the gym. I was always getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I wanted to be, every gym I went into, I wanted to be the strongest guy in that gym. So I was like, rest is in me. To do pool lifting, I don't need to worry about trying to do archery or shooting or rowing or fucking wheelchair rugby, powerlifting, caveman sport. Let's see who's the fucking strongest guy. <laughs> Let's see who can beat me at lifting something and we'll just go caveman style and it really changed everyone. And it, and it got me through. It probably got me through Headley Court. Just just that mindset. How, how did you, at what point did you, so you got blown up in 20, uh, 20, no, 10. 2010. Yeah. 29, I said 29 then, 20. 2009, 2010, and then when did you make the Paralympic team then? Well, I got discharged in 2013. Fuck, that's a while. Yeah, yeah, do you, but do you know, I had, I had about fucking 30 operations though. Do you know, the, the thing is, what people don't understand is you got blown up, they save your life, they do operations to save their life. <coughs> they don't really worry about how you're going to, how the sockets will fit on your legs. They fucking save your life. They stop the bleeding and they do that. And then you come out of the hospital and then you see someone like the prosthetic team or the physio and they go, we really need to fucking sort your legs out. They're in shit state. And you look and go, what? And then you're going to have operations and they move stuff around and they were taking bits of my back off. It was sort of like, like a nip and tuck. They'd just go, right, you've got a big bit of fat on your back. What we've got to do, we've got to take that, we've got to stick it on the end of your stump because your stump's not a good shape. And that'll work. And then we'll, we'll pull your arse cheek round to your thigh and that'll take all that scarring off. And yes, there's content. I wouldn't like to think how many some guys have been operated on. How many times? But I know I stopped counting at about 40. And I've probably been near 50 now. And I only probably had 20 in hospital. So I've had more operations out of hospital. Just titivating. Like, my pelvis is still fucked. My pelvis is just, when it, the shockwave went through it, it cracked my pelvis and I just decided not to get that fixed, but it still hurts me, huh? Just not settled right. So anyway, you had to do all these operations and then that was it. Time goes and you're like, it's, it's a scary thing. You go into the med board and you go, right, Mickey, you can walk. We're pretty on top of your surgeries. That's it, mate, you're out. Not much more than that. And you're like, shit, that is it. Uh it's a weird thing I got really uh, I didn't want to do resettlement because I got focused on breaking into the Paralympic team so I was mm. getting putting on these let's go learn how to write a CV let's go on and I was just like we're going to cross deck everything you, you've done as senior NCO in the army and we're going to bring you into middle <coughs> management I was literally fucking dying of boredom do you know when they were saying this to me I was like no 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 I cannot f I'm, I'm not ready just to jump straight into Civvy Street just Calm your passions there, mate. Just, I cannot be sitting in an office just now. I need to break this in slowly. I mean, I don't think the office is ready for me. And I was just speaking to my coach. And I said, can you do this full time? I mean, if you're good enough, if you're good enough, you can do it full time. If you lift enough weight, they'll pay you to be, they'll fund you through the National Lottery and UK Sport. They'll fund you to be a full time athlete. And I just said, right, what do we need to lift? Let's fucking do it. How much do you need to lift? I pro uh, then I probably had to lift about 180 kgs, weighing about 70. What, bench pressing? Yeah, bench press. Fuck me. And this is a weird thing about this sport. Of all the fucking sports I could have chose, if you take... So when I was powerlifting before, just say I weighed 80 kgs, 85 kgs, if I could bench 160, I was probably top five in Britain. Do you know what I mean? I have a sick comp. I'd probably win my weight group at the Army Champs. I went along, and we talk about being a better person. 
I got invited to be a talent ID squad to go and see what I could lift. And uh, all the athletes who are now, all the lifters from London, who I'm now part of my team were there. And I do it now when a new athlete comes in. You see them coming, it's like anything. It's like a new guy coming, he's getting it. He's fucking, he's leaving and he can't fucking, you don't want him to be able to push his wheelchair out there. He's fucking getting it that day. It's like if you get a new guy and take him on fizz in it. He's, he's getting doing. fucking hammered. So I went in and I was like, well, they obviously don't know who Mickey Yule is here. These fucking lunatics. These guys in wheelchairs. They're in wheelchairs. Of course I'm going to be strong. I still had a shit attitude. I still didn't think I would be disabled. I still, <clears throat> without meaning it, automatically thought, because I was this big, tough squaddy, I should be stronger than a guy in a wheelchair. I went up. Oh, what do you want to do, mate? Powerlifting. I'll go over there. That's where that's where I'll be best. Couldn't lift nothing. Lifted about 130 k's and was expecting to get in the GB team. They told me to go away, train harder and maybe come back another time. I was expecting to be selected there and then. So I remember leaving, I got in the car and I just thought, what are you doing? This is a prime example of your shit attitude. Do you know what I mean? You had guys there that weighed 55 k's that could bench 175 k's. These are the best of the best bench pressers in the whole of Britain. Better than anybody able-bodied. <clears throat> the able-bodied powerlifters now who are doing bench press, they wouldn't even come and train with us now in Loughborough University. They just wouldn't be able to keep with us. What do you mean? They just couldn't. So just You say, couldn't lift heavier? We would kill them. We would destroy them. See, see, really? So I weigh, what was, what was my goal this year? Because oh, of, of the weight difference? You... Well, the, well yeah, I, get, I get weight added to me. I get weight added to me. Like a handicap kind of thing. So, just say, they expect me to have bigger legs. So they add weight to me. Right. But even when they add weight, they just, they wouldn't be able to live with us. So just say I weighed 75 k's this year. I want to bench 200 k by the end of the year. And if you take that into a civvy gym or a powerlifting federation, there's probably only one or two people in the whole country that get near that. And I just think it's because of what we've got, the support system we've got at Loughborough. My wee mate weighs 55 k's. He's benched 202. Jesus Christ. Near four-time body weight. That's Dude, mental. It's fucking crazy. Honestly, you've got some little ninjas there. What's so special about Loughborough then? We've just got the best coaches. We've got the best service support. We've got the best physios. You're there. We, we train. We train and we could... You look over in a corner and you've got... Dylan White, the heavyweight boxer, do you know what I mean? Ready to go for world championships. He's in the corner, beast of himself. You look down, Adam Peaty, this world champion swimmer's there. He's smashing it. You look around, you've got the bobsleigh team, you've got everybody. You're in that gym at that time because you're elite. You better fucking train hard for it. And, and we train harder than anybody. If you're going to be in our team, we go abroad, part of powerlifting GB. Our setup, we, we carry a weight behind us, so we can go. And the Russians, who are now back in after the doping banner, will go over. And the Polish guys are there, strong nations, and they'll know that just being with just being selected by the team that you're strong, that we're ready to beat them. It's just a setup, it's, and, and <clears throat> it, it, it carries on well from the military because what you do is you see there's a comp coming up in three months, and it's just in my head it's pre-deployment training. Right, what do we need to do? To get to this comp in the best shape I've ever been in. Right, we need to sleep well, we need to eat well, and we need to train like a fucking monster. And then we're going to repeat that, and we're going to repeat it, and we're going to live a boring life like a monk. And it's all about getting to that competition, lifting the biggest you've ever done, and then we'll come back and you'll sort of catch up with your social life, and you'll catch up with that, and then you'll go again. And you'll go again. How long do you get in between competitions normally? Or does it vary? Yeah, probably about three or four months. In between, so it's like yeah. resting, chilling, but not too much, not getting fat. No, nah, so it's just like boxing, we love to make weight. The lighter you can be and the more you can lift, the better it is. Unless you're a giant. If you're a big guy, then you just you just go for it. Because there's no upper. There's no oh, upper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're over 110 k's, you may as well be 150 k's. There's got a big Iranian guy who weighs about 180 k's, bench press is 310. 310k. That is a solid squat for, for a recognised powerlifter. 
and he's putting it through his arms. And I tell you what, the big lump could probably double it as well. He's not even reached it. I, I, I think before. Is he a Paralympian? Is he? Paralympian. 310. Fuck me. And at competitions that are drug tested. So not at these crazy little federations where everybody's juiced up. Do you know what I mean? He will be under drug testing during that competition. He's not wearing any supportive clothes on. He may as well lift it naked. 310, down on his chest, paused, and then lifted. How long have you got a pause for? Visible pause. <laughs> no bouncing. None of the shit you see on YouTube. I see some people lifting and they go, oh my God, I just, I, I want to slap them. The technique's so bad. That's one thing about Paralympic uh, powerlifting. It's got the strictest uh, technique out of all of them. It's because it's, it, there's money involved. Do you know what I mean? If you're a Paralympic champion, you're gonna, you, you're on big money. And there's, there's not money normal. There's not money in the Olympics, is there? Or is there? Uh, Apart from sponsorship. No, so it's weightlifting. Right. So weightlifting, because powerlifting, uh, there's not the, a lot of federations argue between each other, and some of them are drug tested and some of them are not. So until they sort that out, they're never going to go to the Olympics. If we're weightlifting, if you're a weightlifter, you join British weightlifting, you sign up to the drug testing. And then you then try and qualify for Europeans, Commonwealths, and Worlds and Olympics. When's the next competition? I go to Kazakhstan in five weeks. What's your regime at the minute? Well, I've just I've just pop, popped in here from Loughborough University on the way back. I'm up there. I go up there Tuesday till Friday. I'll work there three three weeks. So my medium, my heavy, and my very heavy training will be up there. And then I'll go home and I'll have an off week. And then we'll go again. So describe that to me, describe your training to me. So like today, what did you do today? So today we, we were benching. So we, today we, we'd call it a big Friday. So, you know, it's a bit cheesy. but uh, and uh, So today wasn't too cheeky for me. So I was doing 145 for five reps. And just keep trying, trying to lift a, a lighter weight as fast as you can. Just to, trying to use different adaptions to, to gain force and strength and power. So instead of just always going to a one rep max, cutting it back a bit to what for me would be about 72.5% or 75% of my one RM, so the max I could lift, and lift it as fast as you can. As many times as you can or no, no, no. five so we, times? We'll lift it five times and we'll record it on a machine which, which records velocity and so you, to the point, pinpoint and you try and beat it. And all the lads will be around you saying... 0.2, 0.3, fast, fast, fast. And you, so rip you, it up. you start off foot above you. You lower, you lower it down steady. Yeah, you lower and it smash down. Smash it up. Onto the chest, pause, bang, down. Explosive pause, force. Bang. Yeah. It's just, it just different adaptions to find that strength. You don't always have to go to, to the extreme of putting your, your body through that maximal load because one thing you'll do is just pick up injuries. So it's trying to keep your strength gains. And maybe just giving your your muscles that little bit of a break from going real, real heavy, but you're still working your nuts off. So often, so t so how often do you do that today then? Just that one, just that one set. How many sets of that did you? Do? Oh, no, nah, so we we'll, uh, we do five sets of that, and then I maxed out on a hundred k, and then we'll go and we'll just do a tricep to failure. Because one thing with bench press is your triceps will get you at the shit. You never see a, a big bench presser. You, your triceps want to be hanging off the back of you like a set of fucking arse cheeks. Do you know what I mean? Do you know when you see those triceps? And I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty straight shooter guy, but if you see a big lump with a great set of triceps, they look like arse cheeks. You know, hanging out the back of his t-shirt. Yeah, I, I, that turns me on so much. That thing. I'm like, <laughs> that, man, that boy, <laughs> that boy can press. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, that's it. One of my coaches used to say to me, "Your triceps should hang at the back of your." your t-shirt like a set of trophies so as you're stood ordering a coffee your competitor's looking at you going fucking hell he's on it look at him <laughs> <laughs> that's it I think it's more to do just intimidating the opposition but yeah triceps told you just, just destroy them yeah and then try and drive the car home yeah yeah fucking hell fuck me so how long will the competition last for in Kazakhstan? it'll, it'll be 12 days uh, through all the weight cut and it's interesting because Russia are just back and oh we talked about this uh, yeah um, yeah Russia have been on three year ban you know what I mean institutionalised doping mm. do you know what I mean so from the very top they were doping 
And the only reason they got caught is because they held the Sochi Winter Games, didn't they? And actually people were allowed in and they could see how they were doing the dope testing and the documentary come out of uh, Icarus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and everyone broke from there, so but but believe me, you know, I wouldn't put Russia up there as the worst. Do you think I I <clears throat> I think that um Certainly, certain sports. I mean, let's take cycling for example. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like corruption in government, right? Yeah, it's corruption in uh, in uh, sports doping. I think everyone is at it at some in some way, shape, or form. Not always state funded, um, and it and again, it varies from sport to sport, country to country, federation to federation. For example, depends on the tests are. But I, I mean, it's got to be the case there. Um, and Russia has to be cracking on with it. Yeah. But what interests me when you we were talking earlier, when yeah. you said about when you mentioned about China. Well, I was I was just saying, do you No, I know. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, yeah. I'll say it. China. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying China's doping. Right? I'll but, say it. China uh, fucking right. doping. <laughs> what I'm saying is, Russia got identified for this because the access that was allowed into Russia around the Sochi and all that, and they were seeing that. Samples were getting put down different tubes, and fucking there was a whole laboratory underneath it, wasn't there? There was a separate thing going on. I thought they were. I thought they were specifically caught. Uh, they were caught specifically because that documentary the, happened to be getting made undercover footage well, at you, the same time. Yeah, yeah. And you needed you needed a whistle. You needed someone to step up. Which, but it's that document. So the documentary is it, Chris? Just yeah, people yeah. listening haven't seen it. Like, so j- sorry, Mickey. So the premise of this documentary is it's got it's on Netflix. Icarus. Yeah. This guy who's a, an American dude, he's a cyclist, amateur amateur or semi pro cyclist. He sets out to prove um how easy it is to um to how much uh, doping can improve yeah. your performance and how easy it is to circumnavigate doping tests. So he does this big race um without doing any uh, doing any doping. It's in France, it's a big race, I think. Then in the year in between between it and the next time of that race, he ends up getting a some an expert on board who's a doper. Oh, who's an expert in anti-doping. Yep. And it happens to end up being the Russian, the head of the Russian anti-doping agency, a guy called Grigory, whatever his name is. Now, in so during this whole thing, and this is all secret, yep. the cyclist doesn't tell anyone he's getting doped, he just records it all. Everything's recorded. Skype calls this guy, he meets Grigory, and Grigory's telling him how to get around the tests, because he knows, because he's an anti-doper, yep. right? At the same time, the scandal hits about... The scandal hits about... Um, the suggestion that there was doping going on with the Russians in Sochi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that scandal hits. And then it all comes out that this guy who's the head of the anti-doping agency, Grigory, yeah. is also the head of doping yeah. for the Russians. Yeah. And every single athlete was doped. And then he basically spills the beans on... Uh, it, the documentary turns from being about this cyclist trying to dope and get away with it to... Holy fuck. Do you know what? I think he fell into that. Yeah, 100% you know, he, 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 it's it, meant. Well, you can tell, can't you? If you're going to if you're going to have the top guy to try and help you dope, you may as well get the top guy on anti-doping. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're not yeah. fucking stupid, are they? No. But, uh, but I just I just look at it and that. So there was access gained to up all the way up to the Russian anti-doping. There's access gained around Sochi. There was access gained to... But there's countries you won't gain access to. You couldn't get in there if you tried, and you certainly wouldn't get in if you were part of World Anti-Doping Agency. Could so, speculate China. Well, yeah, yeah. If so you go, yeah, we want to come in and do some dope testing. I'll tell you what, athletes would suddenly just go... Poof. How How can they... How can China... As an example, yeah. China. As, just yeah. as an example. How can China... How could China get away with that? How could they enter the Olympics if they wouldn't allow anti-doping Because they would have their own uh, anti-doping agency, like Russia. But... Uh, Hang on, WADA and OSADA and that. Oh, well, yeah. OSADA, is it OSADA, Olympic? Well, well you said as America. So, so no, WADA, sorry. WADA do the Olympics testing, don't they? So, yeah, so WADA. So I've been on, uh, we, we've got what's called whereabouts. So our anti-doping agency, UCAD, <clears throat> have to know my whereabouts, where I am, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. So I they have, can just rock up and test you? They can rock up here. They could knock that door. And go, can we get, cut this short? I need to test Mickey. And get on the podcast. Bl- <laughs> fucking, you love it, isn't it? <laughs> Blood and urine. Blood and urine. So on the build-up, I went to Hungary last month, and on the build-up to that, within a four-month period, I had five tests, five knocks on the door. Not like five organised tests, five knocks on the door. 
So we have to give an hour slot every day. It's normally in the morning because you know you're always in. Seven to eight, I am telling UK Antidoping, I am here to be tested. Now, sometimes they won't come at your slot. They can do an out-hours out test because they'll just chance that you're in. Uh, either because they can't get there at the, the that, that morning slot or they just want to do an out-hours test. So in the build-up to that, I've got five tests, blood and urine. Now, what other countries doing that? I'll tell you, fucking none of them. America, no? America, yeah. I'm, if I'm talking about power powerlifting, strangely, they've not got quite a big power powerlifting team. You would then think maybe Australia. They've got quite a good anti-doping agency. Speak to the lads, they're still not getting tested like the lads in the UK. Why do you think that is? I think it's money. It's funding. So if you're going to test a Paralympic sport, then there has to be funding for that because it's all money. Luckily, I think culturally, we want to not be seen as at all cheating. And this comes culturally as well. So when we talk about Russia, I just say we use fucking, we use another strong country. Just say Nigeria, right? Really strong boys. Cult, just strong men. Really dominant, right? And, or the lads who got caught in Russia. What if you're from Siberia, right? And you're living in a fucking shithole of a house and you've got five kids, but you're disabled and you're strong. And this is for an example. And the head coach who's in Moscow goes, you can come on our programme, but you're doping. We dope. And they won't say dope and they'll say, you've got to take these vitamins. Some of the lads might never even know. <coughs> they'll say, on this team, the nutritionist gives you vitamins every day and we want you to take them. And, and you will take them. If you don't take them, you're not on the team. However, what we're going to do is we're going to give you a flat in Moscow. You're going to get your kids and your family out of there. You're going to stay in Moscow as long as you're on the team. And we're going to put your kids down to the local school. And we'll give you free health care. Whatever. What do you do? You take those vitamins, don't you? fucking dope, aren't you? You yeah. fucking take those vitamins. What if you were from fucking, I don't know. You've just been in Mozambique. Do you know what I mean? I don't know how many disabled people are in Mozambique. Imagine if they said, right, we're going to dope. And we're going to change your life. We're going to change your family's life. Culturally, we're against it. But we live quite a comfortable life. You, you say that. I mean, we. I, I've discussed. I can't think of it in the podcast. We talk about like a. Uh, we talk about the cycling and the doping scandals of the cycling and the Sky Team and all that. And 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 I was thinking through it and I discussed it with someone. Is imagine you're a cyclist and you're really good amateur. Yeah. And then you're really good semi pro. You're really fucking good, right? And you're that. And you and you like your your mindset. You're like, I am. I am gonna be the best of the best. I am gonna be on that flipping team I'm going to be on this team and you're a bit you're a bit naive with what she goes on the top you know, I'm going yeah. to be there and you build everything you know, everything you do all your livelihood your sponsors it's, everything you do carries your family forward everything is reliant on your career going forward and then you get to a point and you get under a team and, not, and, and they go and then it becomes apparent to go any further you've got to be doping you've got to be doing things you don't want to be doing so at that at that sort of moral crossroads you can yeah. go, pff, bollocks ain't doing it. But then the the caveat to that is your whole life is down the pan. Everything you've done since you were maybe 12, yeah. 13, 14 years old, down the pan. Everything your family is working towards, all the hopes you had and everything, like you were saying, like your children think yeah, yeah. of you and, and, and your wife is fucking thinking of you, down the pan, down the pan. What do you do? So, some people are going to take that flipping those pills, they're going to take those injections, take those blood yeah. transfusions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah, a, it's you, a hideous decision. I hate the things on a position people have been in. Yeah, well, you, you look at Lance Armstrong's era. Do you know what I mean? He still, if you look at his Instagram and that, he's still got his yellow jerseys up and his big sort of. Uh, Is he? Yeah, yeah, he's still got them up. He's seven of them, isn't he? And his big sort of uh, trophy room that he's got. Because he's saying everybody was. Uh, I was still the best cyclist. That's what he says. Because we, everybody was at it. I was just taking what everybody else was. Do you know what I mean? And and, and and that's probably the era that era that's put such a bad a bad sort of mark on a uh, cyclist because you're right. You look at cyclists on the Tour de France, which I love watching, and you look at them and go, hmm. Because other professionals have said nobody wins the Tour de France without doping. Do you know all the ones who won it before? Lance Armstrong. He he will say no one's won a yellow yellow jersey without doping. Mm. But then think who's won yellow jerseys? Yeah. Fucking hell. How far did you go back? Change the Some of the biggest looks. names in our bloody sport. Mm. Yeah, but you go, nah, can't 
can't be right. Mm. But then we're not, we're not in the system, are we? What do they know? I used to listen to Lance Armstrong's uh, podcast when the tour was on, and he would sort of tell you who was going to win every day. Yeah, this is what they're going to do tomorrow. You're like, what the fuck? Really? Yeah, yeah. Someone, else, this is who will attack tomorrow. He's going to have to attack because his sponsors need to get a bit of TV time, so he's going to go, and then they'll go for a while, and then this is the day that this guy should attack because Froome's too good in the mountains, so he needs to go today, and you're like, fuck, and what the hell? I'm still involved. But uh, do you know what with open? I would think, and I want to think, that everybody's on the same system as me, which will be the whereabouts testing is going to be clean. Because I tell you what, I couldn't, I couldn't, how how can you, how can you dope when someone's going to knock your door at any time? What if someone knocks this door and goes and make your blood in urine? What about control of supplements and stuff like that? How yeah, do you, you select all that? Uh, that's the thing, that's the thing people are going to get caught up with. Because, oh, fucking hell, like, like, the supplements and the protein bars, you can't even go on a service station now. I mean, no. You know what I mean? And you, you, if you, no, if you go, you know, I, want, I don't want to have a burger king, I'm going to have a protein bar. And then you're looking at it going, like for me, I have to look at what can I take? You know, we have to, I have to look for the ones that have got informed sport written on it. Because informed sport is, is a standard that they should meet to go everything is sort of tested. There's nothing in it. But you could take an informed sport uh, protein bar. I could be sponsored by people that have got informed sport, which is to try and keep the highest of the highest levels. And if you failed, don't matter. Mm-hmm. We have a thing called 100%, 100% me. It's you. You are 100% responsible for what goes in your body. Look at what they're putting in meats these days. Do you know what I mean? Mexican meat. This is the fucking next big thing, isn't it? They're blasting them full of steroids, all these cows, to get them bigger so there's more meat, so they're getting more mm-hmm. bang for the buck. I don't know where meat comes. I love a steak. Mm. I, eat, oh, oh. I eat a big steak. You know what I mean? Is that going to fuck me up? It's like, where do you end? But really, if you were going to get caught out with that, then if it's if it's a tainted supplement and you've done everything you could, I think you just have to go for fucking right hands up. I've done everything I could. I'm just going to have to take this. The difference if you're taking growth hormone. Or if you're a cyclist and you're, mm. and you're doing blood transfusions or EPO, or if if I'm every two weeks taking a fucking testosterone injection, I think, yeah, there is different levels. But I tell you what, UCAD don't, and maybe that's the reason why we're keeping it so clean. They'll go, so really there wouldn't be much difference between me taking a protein bar from fucking Waitrose and failing a test than me fucking injecting testosterone every third day on my arse cheek. Mm. You still fail the test. Yeah, I watch a, I watch a lot of UFC and I, I listen to Joe Rogan podcast a lot. And there's there's been a, they sort of turn there. I, are you? Do you yeah, 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 yeah. So no, they've got awesome. like they. I mean, they claim to have the, the best anti doping and drug t- uh, doping dope testing uh, regime in the world. Yeah. UFC, and arguably they have, and they have a procedure they can appeal. But one of the things I learned, I've learned along the way, you listen to that and seeing like the biggest names get caught. And then you think, fucking hell, I can't even believe doing it. Yeah. Is that a, is again, going back to the supplements. Like, you go buy in, as an example, a Joe Blocks, you go buy in, for example, a tub of creatine off of, uh, off the internet, because you yeah. get it cheaper, or for some, you know, and you get it, and you think, fucking hell, this stuff's mega. Fucking, this stuff's fucking brilliant. Yeah. There's some, there's some suppliers, like in China and places yeah, like yeah. that, they chuck, like, Steroids in there, yeah. they'll chuck shit like in there because they want to have the edge, and you're on fucking roids, and you think you're taking creatine, yeah, yeah. and there's there's roids in there, and this is your blogs in the gym getting fucking massive. Yeah. It's it's mental, and another other things they're creating. Apparently, a lot of the times, yeah. that's not a lot of times. There are times of that stuff, yeah. especially in c- countries that aren't that yeah. controlled. They cut in that stuff. Uh, they, sorry, they'll they'll cut cocaine with creatine right. because you can bulk out cocaine right, with creatine. Yeah. yeah. yeah? And that gets done in the same factory. It makes sense to make, yeah, yeah. make creatine yeah, and yeah. cocaine in the same place. Yeah, yeah. You're taking you're taking your creatine. Fucking cocaine go in your system. <laughs> hey, you get it's strong. Like, it sounds, it sounds Imagine far you're out. Imagine you It sounds far out. But this is like, it's fact. I mean, there's been a, a, appeals where you, they, they go back to the source of where this creatine was taken. Or they, haven't taken this, they, they haven't taken a recommended supplement as recommended by USADA or by UFC's fucking drug testing people. And they go, yeah, you got cocaine in your system. 
John Jones, because uh, you were yeah. taking dick pills, and uh, yeah. was, they happened to be cocaine in them, because where the dick pills are made, we're in a factory where they also make cocaine. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> mental. Imagine mental, your training. Like. You're tra- they'd be going, Mickey's on fire today, man. I'll tell you one thing. We speak about, if you're training every day with your coach and your teammates, you should fucking know. Do you know what I mean? This is why I always look at it. The athlete always gets done, and the coach, you look, look at all the coaches that have <clears> got history of, of drug cheats around them, and they're no band. And you're like, what, you, you work with that athlete? And you fucking just, you realise he's running two seconds quicker and you never questioned nothing you just thought that your technique was fucking just worked mm. out of the blue for 10 yeah. weeks come on the coaches not well uh, that rich fr- I'm going to finish, finish up in a minute but that, that rich thrown in is the rich thrown enough for CrossFit alright yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a few uh, conspiracy theories about him I, I, I was watching one it was a couple of years back and like he was just basically this pretty good CrossFitter he was yeah. just a, yeah, when yeah, CrossFit yeah. started out pretty good pretty good and then between seasons, like literally one season he was sort of 10th, finishing 9th, 10th in the competitions, and then next season he is fucking blowing everyone away. And they show you a bunch of going, what were you doing, buddy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what were you doing in between? Yeah. Right. He's like, oh, yeah. I've started eating potatoes for my breakfast. <laughs> oh, all right, mate. Aye. Right, mate. Uh, we got a few minutes if we need them. Anything we haven't spoken about, anything you want to mention, anything you want, a shameless plug opportunity, basically. Um, how can people, in fact, how can people follow you in Kazakhstan? How can people follow you? Yeah, Why yeah, you on, social media? on Twitter, MickeyYule9, Instagram, uh, Big Mickey 9 that's a bit cheesy, so uh, yeah, just find it, that'll be me. But yeah, no, nah, that's it, follow the journey. I'm trying to qualify for the uh, Tokyo Paralympics, and you know, we were talking about everything there, but uh, only the top eight guys in the world go. So it's uh, it's my next goal. Get to, I went to Rio, yep, and I think maybe I got to Rio. Did I do everything I wanted to do in Rio? No, I come six. Do you know what I mean? It's one of the things that grinds you a little bit. And I'll tell you what happened in Rio. I went for a medal, right? These fucking pussies. I hope they're list- I hope they're listening, right? We chucked a weight on for a medal because we were there to medal, and so we go. We're going to try and get a bronze medal. Chuck the weight on. And do you know what they done? They bet my second lift, so they just tried to beat me by a case. So they were they would rather finish fifth than I was like, come on, boys. I know what do you mean. They chucked the weight on. So explain this to me. So just say, uh, so I was in I was in Rio. Just I think I'd lifted 180 k's, and just say the medals are going on 187. Right, I'm at last lift 187. Right, but the other guys were going on oh, last lift 181 because we'll beat Mickey, and I might come fifth instead of six, or I might come fourth instead of six. And I'm looking at them going. You you want a medal, don't you? One eight seven's a medal number. What are you doing, pussy boy? Just get the weight on. Let's medal. But they never. They wanted to beat me, and I wanted to medal. And then I missed it, and they beat me. With this big photograph, and I was like, "How are you happy? You've just come fifth. No one's here to finish fifth. We're here to take a medal." Back. Right. So you were lifting one eighty. I'm just trying, you were lifting one eighty, and for yeah. you to medal, you need the next lift. You need to go right for one eight seven. Yeah. If you fail one eight seven, your winning lift was one eighty. One eighty. Right. So, so you did that, and they went for one eight one just so, so they could beat you. So they. So they. Sons of bitches. <laughs> little shits. Right. <laughs> Do you know what? I could see the little <laughs> smug face on them as well, and I was like, "I'll slap you in a minute, boy." But uh, nah, go to go to Tokyo. Oh, You're a two time Paralympian. And let's go there with no regrets. And, I, and but it's a hard road, do you know what I mean? Keep injury free. Keep on trucking. Uh, that's it, man. Follow the routine. Follow the process. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a boring life, but it seems to work. And uh, yeah, just get, get there. Be a two-time Paralympian and then go medal. That's a big goal. Fucking beast it, mate. You're yeah, an inspiration man. to awesome. fucking uh, anyone. Civvy, military, male, female, adult, kid. I fuck, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, I, oh, I cheers, honestly man. do and um, I wish you all the best in Kazakhstan yeah cheers mate uh, and uh, yeah you're fucking beast it's been an absolute pleasure mate cheers, cheers buddy